losers. It's those bad girls. Well, that follows at nine. how few people know that we're here. People are so surprised when they come through the archway and the place goes on and on and no one would ever know that it was here. First time I came here I couldn't find it. When I did eventually find my way in I was completely and totally amazed. It's an oasis in the, in the middle of London that you wouldn't expect to find. Taxi drivers, they come here and they say, well, what is this place? And you'd think that they you sort of know it, really. But, uh, you know, it's a well-kept secret. Sutton founded at Charterhouse both a school for poor boys and also a hospital or home for impoverished gentlemen. Sutton's dream of a community where scholars, heroes and adventurers were given safe haven captured the spirit of the Elizabethan age. Charterhouse flourished. The gentlemen pensioners were known as brothers, men who had served their country well retired army officers, merchants, and brave sea captains who'd fought against the Armada. They lived out their days in peace and comfort. The school became so successful it outgrew the buildings, and the boys moved out to the country. But today, in the shadow of the Barbican Towers, the brothers still live in the Tudor mansion, hidden in the heart of the city of London. Most people find out about Charterhouse through word of mouth. Certainly we don't advertise. We couldn't cope with a long waiting list. When they arrive, they must, of course, be fit for their age. But once they're here, it's for the rest of their lives. They don't have to worry about their heating bills and shopping and all that sort of thing. It's all taken care of here and that they're not going to have to move on elsewhere. This is, this is their home now. They come from all walks of life. Um, we've got quite a few clergy, teachers, writers, musicians. You name it, we probably have it. Over about 15 or 16 years at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden. I was in the chorus, 1937, 38, 39, at Glyndebourne. Practice before breakfast every morning on the Boyston piano. I have a repertoire of about 400 songs in all languages, opera, oratorio, German leader, French, Italian, and all that. Spagna, 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 Mille Trey. 
Questo cosa di ne abbiamo le risiti di te, perché ti sto facendo una cosa, ma che c'è anni per ti faccio? Quando non ti conti, non ti fa, non mi fa, ma non mi fa, non mi fa, ma non mi fa. When my wife died, I decided to apply here. I knew she would not like me to feel sad in any way. So uh, armed with that, and the fact that she passed away without too much suffering, I came to Charter House and uh, settled in. All I want is a room in Bloomsbury. Just Knowing that my piano was coming and uh, all my the furniture that I had chosen as well, I was uh, optimistic. But then I'm an optimistic nature, you see? Which reminds me of uh, the notice on an optician's shop. <clears throat> you can't be optimistic if you have misty optics. Oh, Mr. Lutus, one in 50 of his jokes is a, is a, is a gem. Yeah. Apart from that, you've heard them before, once or twice. I like to think that I live here as well. Oh, I might live over in the corner, but I still live in Chart House. And that, as such, it's my front door down there where John is. They're all characters in their own way. There's, there's no two of them the same. Uh, and you get a different reaction from each one. And, and I enjoy a good laugh with all of them. Completely different from the, from the clergyman to the, to the soldiers. It, uh, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. They're just a real nice bunch of gents. Sorry, Mr. Weathers, drop off again. There's no place to compare with this. Without the brothers here, I wouldn't have a job. I think I can remember remarking at the interview that uh, if I could work with toffs like this, I'd be only too pleased to come. Oh. The knock's always going wrong here. Well, now, here we are. All my ancestors. Egbert, first king of England. Hugh Capet, first king of France. Um, Richard Cox. Bishop of Ely in Queen Elizabeth's time, and um, headmaster of Eton, where Thomas Sutton was at school, the founder of Charterhouse. Um, Edward I, King of England, my 21st great-grandfather. <laughs> uh, Switzerland, skiing, <laughs> gorgeous, <laughs> lovely picture. Um, my appointment as a brother of Charterhouse as a sponsee of the Queen Mum. The Queen Mum is a governor of Charterhouse. I have been hoping that I might get an invitation to the garden party, but I haven't done. I don't mind. <laughs> I got married in 42. Up till then, you know, I'd been a sort of busy bachelor in London, <laughs> in the HSC, the Territorial Regiment, close here, London City Territorial Regiment, and, and generally lived um, an active bachelor life. When I came out of the army, I was earning proper money. We, we bought a nice house in Godalming, and we stayed there and brought up our family of five children, and this is how I got associated with Charter House and got to know them all. The master here was a master at the school and was an old friend of mine. My wife had died a few years before and I'd been looking out for a place where I'd been looked after. And I thought, this is it. The conditions of entry were very vague. You mustn't have much money and, um, and you must be of um, good character and you must be interviewed by the doctor and the master and the registrar and all that. Well, of course, I knew them all, so my, my interview was um, a couple of glasses of sherry <laughs> with the master, and that was that. Oh, we're terribly lucky. I get a thrill every time I come in to think that I live in this Tudor mansion. I do what I want, when I want. Ken call him out the window and say that. Get off the grass. Please don't take any notice. Well, 
summoned by bells four times a day, breakfast and lunch and tea and supper. This is a, a very good setup, yeah, wonderful food, and I tend to leave it alone sometimes, otherwise yeah, the weight starts to come on. It's very easy here to sit down and be waited on, and it's not always the best thing. You can soon become institutionalized in a place like this, no matter how free it is, if you allow yourself. But I think you get that in any institution, don't you? I hate that word, don't you? To be institutionalized, it's a bit like the workhouse. When I was a little boy in Manchester, we lived in Crumpsall, and my mother always used to say, if anybody asks where you live, love, always say higher Crumpsall, because lower Crumpsall, that's where the workhouse was. It was only about half a mile around the corner, but it made enormous difference, you see. I came to London in 1945, and I got a scholarship to the Guildhall School of Music. When I left there, of course, you were thrown out in the artistic wilderness and had to do all sorts of things. I loved Gilbert and Sullivan, so I wrote a, a show called Gilbert and Sullivan a la carte. It was a one-man show for schools. And I lived off that for about 15 years. And we went to South Africa, I toured with it on the QE2, and it was a, a very good experience. And we've done it here at Charterhouse. Charterhouse is a, a very living place. You are allowed out. Good morning, John. How are you this morning? Mm -hmm. We're going on duty. We're going to be on duty at the uh, museum. Uh, when you're retired, you can work a lot for charity. You look after the Bart's Hospital Museum. They depend on uh, volunteers over there, so several of us go over there to look after that. We are part-time curators in the museum here. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, Would you like to sign our petitions? We've got 22,000 signatures already. 22,000 plus. They're the ones that are counted. You know, we get... Well, now you've got 22,003. We're just going to put charter house because we're all in there. Where do I get one of those shirts from? Reopen A and E. I'll put my new shirt on. He's putting his shirt on. There we are. One of our shirts. Well, it's free. I'm not paying for it. I'll put you out for you. No, I can ask you for a five. It's another cross on it. It's crucial. I would have thought so. I mean, that's what I usually sell them for. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, you've got to actually be here through the day to sort of get the uh, atmosphere. The scenery's brilliant for a start, you know, you've got greenery all round you, it's like being in the country. We have the police patrolling round here every, well, about every two days. I mean, they, uh, they like it here as well. Taking the two this afternoon? Uh, yes, 2.15. Oh, OK, John. Yes, no problem. Do you want me to take the money, or...? Oh, if you yeah. can take the money, yes. Yeah. Don't let Philip Luton stay running. No, I'll have to keep it away from him. This little pool has just been opened up recently. <laughs> And um, I thought it needed some a duck in it, for instance. And I brought this um, this plastic duck from my my cottage in Surrey before I lived here. Um, it's now <laughs> floating on a sort of house home pool. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Charter House. 
<laughs> My name is Gordon Honey, and I'm your guide today. Well, the old monastery was pulled down when Henry decided to divorce Catherine of Aragon, and I think we all know that bit of bloody English history. <laughs> uh, and the monks here would not comply with him, with his wishes, and so they were taken from here and cruelly executed. Let's move through, and I can talk about the various things that we can see, because that's far more interesting, and then we'll deal with the various historical aspects of Charles. It's full of history, and it's a wonderful place. My little room is over all these places that it happened, you know. And I, I lie awake at night thinking, my goodness, uh, in my little bed here, I'm sleeping on top of all this history. And it's fascinating. Fascinating place. These are all the Howard crests, yes? All the Howard. Oh, these are all the Howard's crests on the ceiling. They belong to the Howard family. That's right. That's right. Morny swarky mali pawns. Evil to he who evil thinks. Charles Dickens paid a visit here in the 1850s, not as a guest, rather as a spy, and wrote some scurrilous accounts about what Charterhouse was like, because it was a pretty grim place in, in Victorian times, you know. Dickens brought to public attention a case of a brother who had complained about something, and he was summoned to this room, and at Christmas time he was told he had to leave, and he was chipped out into the streets with nowhere to go. So, you know, that, uh, that was a pretty uh, harsh regime, but it's very easy today. We, we have a wonderful life. We come and go as we please. We had a chap here who wrote a book on Buddhism. He thought Buddhism was wonderful, although basically it was supposed to be Church of England. I was terrified coming into a large place like this from a very small house. When my wife died, my son, who knows more about these things, put my name down here. I didn't know about it. It was well meant. And about six years later, the master wrote and asked me to come in for an interview. And that was it. <laughs> the people here are very nice, very nice, yes. They're all men, of course. I'm isolated here because I, I'm up here for one thing, away from most of them. I don't complain, I suffer in silence. Some of them are my sort of idea of an English gentleman, but they're all gentlemen as far as I can tell, you know. Oh, good morning. They're all uh, very polite. They're always very smartly dressed, most of them. And they're all, uh, well, they're all, they're all, as far as I'm concerned, they're gentlemen, yeah. Uh, hello. Well, the first time I came here was with the Kensington Chelsea National Trust Association. And I came here by Sharaban. Um, and I look around here, very fine weather. Oh, this is the place for me. In 40 years' time, perhaps I could get in here. I was a child surveyor. Although I enjoyed my life before, it was far too busy. I was impoverished. Work was very, work was almost non-existent. Uh, I couldn't cope with shopping or anything. Then I thought, look, then I got an offer of a place here. And that's, with that started, I, once they said they could, I could come in, and they ca I came here about two days later and saw Mrs. Ho Holyoke, the former assistant um, registrar. When would you like to come? And I said, come in for Christmas. This was an absolute godsend. Now I live entirely for pleasure. Eat, 
drink and read and read and read and read and socialise. There we are, Colin. Thank you very much. Well, what can you say about Mr Moore? He's just a character. He's like a big teddy bear, really. He's a bit upset because he was the youngest brother here, but now he's been up usurped by Mr uh, G. You know, there was talk of uh, putting uh, poison in the coffee so as he'd still be the youngest. I spent most of my working life as a diplomat with the Foreign Office. The story of my life has been changing my address every three years or so. <laughs> this place is absolutely marvellous for someone who is prepared to uh, live in a community. We eat together, we see one another as much as we want, we can be as private as we like. We all have sort of independent social life, we do things outside, um, but um, we nonetheless feel part of, of Charter House. You want uh, another tart? I won't have another, thank you. I'm another tart. Well, that's it. I need building up. Oh, yeah? Mm. No, I got another little lecture this morning about losing weight. Mm -hmm. Have you lost any, though? <laughs> not much. <laughs> A little bit, but uh, not, not enough for the quacks. Mm. I know these days, the old tend to live longer. Tend to live longer. Um, my children, who are now in their 20s, early 30s, um, well, my oldest son is just about to have his first child. And I know what a nuisance elderly parents can be. <laughs> the thought that they won't have to worry about what to do with dad when he's seen her um, is really quite consoling. It means that you can start planning for the rest of your life. We all know it might be over tomorrow, but you know, it could well be another 20 years or so. You know. Isn't it? No, this has got to be this has got to be perpendicular. Is it? Yeah. Hey, don't you touch my ball. That's red. That's, that's, that's my ball. That's red. <laughs> oh. I last played this 44 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Bad as I am. Brilliant. Oh. 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 Fortunately, there are always a number of, of, of kindred spirits here in the 40 or so of us living here. Um, unfortunately, they have a way of dying. <laughs> we get to read the obituary columns of the papers before we read uh, the main body of it. <laughs> I'm afraid that's true. They don't throw us out when we get to, <laughs> when we get ill. They look after us right to the end. And uh, they ensure that we're buried where we want to be buried. <laughs> Maybe we should have keep fit classes or uh, massage parlours and jacuzzis. I think that would be a very good idea, actually. To... Keep people alive, the laying on of hands. We're all charter house boys. <laughs> Old boys. Gentlemen, March winds and April showers make way for Where's the borage? <laughs> <He's got everything laughs> there we are, sir. From the mantel, please. <laughs> March winds and April showers. <laughs> Romance will soon be ours. An outdoor paradise for two With your lips to mine In a thrill divine I'll be so inspired That I'll get you the moon for a toy balloon March winds and April showers Make way for happy hours and May time June time, love time 